Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to today's Friday Reflections on this, the 9th of October 2020. I hope everybody is well, wherever you're watching this from, that uh, you and your families are doing well and are in good health and, uh, you know, things are good, inshallah. Um, if that is not the case, um, then I pray Allah makes things easier for you, um, whatever those difficulties happen to be. Now, we are approaching uh, the month of Rabi al Awal at the moment, which is when we traditionally make a lot of more leads um, and celebrate the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, there are some Muslims out there who disagree with these practices, and there are those who will even go as far as to say that it is. Uh, Bida, that is a kind of innovation within the religion, and others that will say it is shirk, which means actually they're trying to say that we worship the Prophet Sallallahu which is not true. Uh, when people are praising the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who are Muslims, uh, we are simply showing respect and love to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, We believe that this is actually something that Allah Himself has asked us to do in the Holy Quran. So it is not something which we are doing to make a partner of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it is simply that we have a lot of love and respect for the Prophet Muhammad. Now, so there are those who are saying that it's bidah, and those who are saying that it is shirk, and there are even some people who will go as far as to say that it is kufr, that it is actually manifest disbelief or rejection of Islam. Now, I would just like to you know, stand up and say that all of these are false. They are false accusations on those who praise the Prophet Muhammad Islam, within um, the normal parameters of Allah Sunnah wa Jamaat. And there is evidence for this. For those who have not encountered this evidence, I'm going to share a bit of this evidence with you now. Um, here I have the Encyclopedia of Islamic Doctrine, Volume 2. The court, which is titled Remembrance of Allah and Praising the Prophet. Uh, this is by uh, Mawlana Sheikh Muhammad Hisham Kabani, who is a great scholar of Islam in our time. And he's also, he was for many years the deputy of Mawlana Sheikh Nazim Adil al Khani, who is a well known uh, Muslim leader. But uh, one of the things I do like about the works of Mawlana Sheikh Hisham Kabani is he documents things. He's done an, an awful lot of research over the years and he puts references to where he gets his information from. So this isn't just someone who is saying that I believe that we should do something or that we shouldn't do something. There are those people who say that and sometimes they are right and sometimes they are wrong. But, you know, one thing that I will acknowledge, among those who say to us uh, that you need evidence, it is true, there is a basis within Islam that you should have evidence and also uh, good logic and reasoning for what you are doing. It shouldn't just be simply that we are just randomly doing stuff that, uh, if we're not careful, that could lead us to doing things that are wrong. So we have to be uh, careful and considered in what practices we say are actually part of Islam. And what I mean by that is we can have a lot of tolerance for things that you know people might do which are not part of Islam. And I believe we should do that as well. We should accept that on an individual basis people might do things a little differently. And that doesn't mean that they are not a Muslim. It doesn't mean that they are a bad Muslim. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean any of that, it's just their own uniqueness. And as long as they don't say that those things are Islam, then as long as they're not something which is very obviously against the teachings of Islam, then we can we can allow it. Um, but of course, if they start saying that these are essential practices that all Muslims should do, um, then they start to cross a line that we shouldn't cross. With regards to Mawlid, um, within the religion of Islam, it is something that if a person doesn't do it, they are not committing a sin. As long as they believe um, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, 
as long as they live their life according to the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah, um, they are a Muslim. We can't say that they're not a Muslim, and there's, there's nothing wrong. If they don't want to do more lead, if they feel a bit uncomfortable with it, or for whatever reason, maybe in many cases just people are busy, um, that is okay. But as long as they don't harbour um, a, a hatred towards people who do celebrate more lead, or think that people who do celebrate more lead are not Muslims, because then they are going to an excess in what they are doing. Islam allows a lot of things within parameters. So it's allowed not to celebrate Mawlid within parameters, as long as you don't go around condemning people who do. Because then you are calling people kafir who are not kafir. Um, then that means that according to the teaching of the Prophet, if you declare someone who's a kafir and they're not a kafir, then the person who's making the declaration is the one who's the kafir. The Prophet said this in a clear hadith. So... We have to be careful about doing that. We shouldn't go to excesses in anything really within Islam. Um, so it's all about balance and maintaining that kind of balance. But when it comes to evidence, there is evidence. And again, there may be some people out there who don't accept some of this evidence, but it's documented. And stuff that's documented has a case. And whether you accept that case or you don't accept that case, well, Islamic scholars throughout history have been debating these things. And I don't think if they were not able to resolve it in 1400 years, that we are going to come to one conclusion today that is going to satisfy 1.61 billion Muslims. But at the same time, we have to accept that if there is evidence for a set of practices, um, and it can be, or it can be justified on the basis of evidence and um pre-existing practices that were similar, then we have to accept there is a case. And if there is a case for something, then we have to accept that um, it is within the parameters of Islam, even if it is not what our particular uh, madhab or minhaj follows, in some cases. Not my case, but in some cases. So here we go. Um, on page 76 of this book, um, which is 2.3, and it's titled Hassan ibn Tabit, the Prophet's Poet. The greatest reciter of Nat, so that's poetry, among the companions was undoubtedly the Ansari Hassan ibn Tabit. His title was Shreya al-Wusul, the Prophet's Poet as reported from Aisha. Bayhaki mentions two narrations whereby Hassan was either 53 or 60 when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went to Mecca. He died at age 120, having lived 60 years in the time of ignorance, of Jahiliya, and 60 years in Islam. According to the words of Ibn al-Salah, Abu David and Termidi narrate from Aisha that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would place a pulpit for Hassan in the mosque on which he would stand and recite the praises of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Verily, Allah supports Hassan with the spirit of holiness, as long as he praises or defends Allah's Messenger. The king of the Copts gave the Prophet, peace be upon him, two wives as a gift. The Prophet, peace be upon him, married one who became the mother of the Prophet's son, Ibrahim, and he gave the other one to Hassan as a wife. The following narration is related from Hassan ibn Thabit. I was a child of seven or eight years of age, who understood everything I saw or heard. One morning, I saw a Jew in Yathrib shouting, O nation of the Jews! They gathered around him, and I listened in. They asked, What is wrong with you? He said, The star of Ahmed has risen, whereby he was born last night. This foreknowledge 
is echoed among the Christians, according to Ibn Abbas's report, at the end of the first book of Sahih al-Bukhari. Ibn al-Nuzur, the religious head of Eilat, by appointment of Heraclius, and bishop of the Christians of Sham, used to, used to relate that one morning after Heraclius had first come to Eilat, he was seized by anxiety, and that some of his patricians said to him, We see that your countenance has changed for the worst. Ibn al-Nazur continued, Heraclius used to be a diviner who gazed at the stars, so when they questioned him, he replied to them, Last night, as I gazed at the stars, I saw that the king of the circumcised had appeared. Which of the nations circumcised themselves? They replied, None but the Jews. Therefore, do not let them worry you in any way. Write to the cities of your kingdom and order them to exterminate their Jewish populations. As they were pondering this, a man sent by the king of Gassan went to Heraclius with information about Allah's messenger. When Heraclius heard this report, he said, Go and see, is he circumcised or not? They inquired and reported back to him that he was. Asked about the Arabs as a whole, the informer said again, they practice circumcision. Heraclius said, Now has the world come, sorry, now has come the time for this nation to rule the world. Heraclius wrote to one of his friends in Rome, who was his peer in learning. Then he travelled to Hims, a city in central Syria, from which he did not leave until his friend's reply had arrived. The letter agreed with Heraclius' opinion about the appearance of the prophet and on the fact that he was a prophet. Heraclius then summoned the Roman authorities to his villa in Hims, ordered the gates locked, and then looked at them and said, O Romans, do you want to reap success? Do what is right, and ensure that your empire will endure. Follow this prophet. At this, they fled like wild asses and made for the gates, but found them locked. When Heraclius saw their loathing of what he had proposed to them, he despaired that they could ever believe. Bring them back to me, he ordered, and then he addressed them again and said, I said this just now only in order to test the strength of your attachment to your religion, of which I am satisfied. At this they prostrated to him and they were happy again. That was the last we heard of Heraclius. When the Prophet Islam, took Mecca, one of those who accepted Islam at the time, Junab al Kalbi, reports that he heard the Prophet say to a certain man, Gabriel is on my right, and Michael is on my left, and the angels hover over my soldiers. Recite a little something. The man bowed his head in silence for a while, then suddenly he said, In Kamil, or perfect meter, O pillar of those who rely upon you, O immunity of those who seek refuge in you, and resort of those who seek foliage and rain, and neighbouring protector of those in need of shelter, O you whom the one God has chosen for his creatures, by planting him in perfection and purity of character. You are the prophet. You are the best of the human nations. O open-handed one, like the outpouring of a swelling sea, Michael and Gabriel are both with you. Help us towards your victory, sent by one mighty, irresistible. Junab continues, I asked, who is this poet? They said, Hassan ibn Thabit. Then I saw Allah's messenger making invocation for him, 
and asking goodness on his behalf. So you see, you know, back in this account of Heraclius, this famous account of Heraclius, which is found in Sahih al-Bukhari, there is a clear indication of poetry that was being read about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and this was accepted. And not only that, but the person who was writing this poetry was someone who Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave a wife. Then we've got uh, the next little piece, uh, 2.4. Kab ibn Zuhair's poem for the Prophet Kab ibn Zuhair, who, who was formerly an enemy of the Prophet composed his famous 58-line ode in expansive meter, which begins with the words Banat Suad, or Suad has left, to ask forgiveness of the Prophet the Prophet ﷺ forgave Kaab and rewarded his nut with the gift of his own mantle. It is said that his mantle was brought by Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan from Kaab's son and later preserved by the Abbasi caliphs in Baghdad until its occupation by the Mongols. Kaab's poem contains the following lines. I was told that the Messenger of Allah had threatened reprisals against me, but with the Messenger of Allah I have hope of finding pardon. I stand in such a place that if an elephant stood there, seeing and hearing what I see and hear, the sides of his neck would shake with terror if there is no forgiveness. By Allah's grace, from Allah's messenger. Verily, the Prophet is a light from which light is sought. A drawn Indian sword, one of Allah's swords, unsheathed. It is upon hearing the praise of line 51 that the Prophet, peace be upon him, placed his mantle on Kab. The instant inspired Al Busui to write his own 162-line poem, Qasida al Buddha, The Ode of the Mantle, which is arguably the most famous and best of all the Naat poems. The first line of Hassan ibn Thabit's poem, O Pillar Relied Upon, was echoed by many subsequent poets. Among them was al Busiri oh, sorry, al himself, in line 155 of his Qasida al Buddha, the line states, O noblest of creatures, I have none with whom to seek refuge, other than you, when the universal event befalls. So here we have two companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sosta, who we have documented evidence that they wrote poetry and the Prophet Sallallahu was happy with this. So who are we today to question that if the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself was happy with it? And then we have this account in 2.5 Sultan Abdul Hamid's poem for the Prophet Sosna. Another poet who looked back to both Hassan's and Busiri's lines is the famous pious caliph of the Islamic State, Sultan Abdul Hamid Khan ibn al Sultan Ahmed Khan. His nat in praise of the Prophet Sosna begins with the line Ya Sayyidi, Ya Rasulullah, Qud bi Yadi. O my master, O messenger of Allah, take my hand. Note that both al Busiri in al Buddha and Sultan Abdul Hamid used the perfect meter chosen by Hassan ibn Thabit for the four lines 
he improvised for the Prophet Sultan Abdul Hamid's poem in praise of the Prophet was engraved on the walls of the Prophet's Hujra in his mosque in Medina in the year 1191 uh, that would be A.H., so that is 1777 C.E. The enemies of the Prophet, peace be upon him, covered up several of the verses with paint so that they could not be read, sparing what suited them. But the poem has been preserved in other ways. It can now be found in the book Mirat al-Haramain by Sabri Basha, the last Sheikh al-Islam, of the Ottoman state. Also the Sheikh of Mecca, Ibn Alawi al-Maliki, reproduced it in his recent book, Shifa al-Fuad bi Ziyarat Qair al-Ibad, the healing of the heart with the visitation of the best of Allah's servants. Following is the text in full with an asterisk indicating verses that were painted over. O my master, O messenger of Allah, take my hand. I have none beside you, nor will I pause to rely on anyone but you. For you are the light of guidance in everything that exists, and you are the secret of munificence and the best reliance. And you are, in truth, the helper of all creation, and you are the guide of mortals to Allah, owner of help. O you stand on the station of praise, singled out by the one who is single, who is not begotten and does not beget. O you from whose fingers rivers burst forth, so that he quenched the thirst of numerous army. Verily, if I am faced with harm and fearful injustice, I say, O Master of Masters, O my support, be my intercessor with the merciful regarding my mistakes and grace me with what eludes my heart and look upon me always and ever with kind eyes and cover with your favour my shortcomings all my life. Kindly bestow on me encompassing forgiveness, for from you, O my Master, I was never separated. I have sought as my means the elect one, the noblest of any that ascended the heavens, the secret of the unique one. O Lord of beauty, exalted is Allah who created him, for such as him in all creation I have never seen. The best of creatures, the apex of messengers, the treasure of humankind and their guide to integrity. In him I have taken refuge. Perhaps Allah will forgive me. This is what I count on and firmly believe. Therefore, his tireless praise shall never cease to be my task, and the love of him sustains me in the presence of the Lord of the throne. Upon him be the purest of endless blessings, without cease together with greetings that cannot be stemmed nor counted. And upon his family and companions, a glorious folk all, the ocean of forgiveness the people of generosity and aid. Blessings and peace on the Prophet, his family and his companions. SubhanAllah. I'm sure in the original language it's even more beautiful, but even the English translation captures the beauty. The next, the next uh, chapter of the book is chapter 3 and it talks about al Busiri's poem in praise of the Prophet, the famous Qasidat al-Buddha. 
I'm not going to read that now, but this book, um, Encyclopedia of Islamic Doctrine, uh, this is volume two, which is talking about remembrance of Allah and praising the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there are a number of volumes of this book. Um, if you can get hold of a copy of it, I highly recommend it because it does clarify a number of points at which Muslims have been attacked on over the years by other Muslims who have a different view of the religion. And to have access to good knowledge, which is from classical sources, is one good way that we can actually educate and inform ourselves so that we are not so reliant on the opinions of others and we're reliant instead upon our own knowledge and understanding. And then it's, it's much more difficult for people to come along and shake our own iman or our own understanding um, and practice of Islam. Um, and unfortunately, this, this will happen. If, if we have knowledge of our religion, then it's very easy to be intimidated by someone who claims to have knowledge of our religion. And I mean, this goes for any subject, but when it comes to something like a religion and way of life, uh, which is our way of practicing certain uh, devotions and cultivating a, a way of understanding, which is not only for this life, but it actually affects our soul in its journey to the next life. Surely on this, we are going to want to invest the time to understand it properly so that we're not shaken away from things which are beneficial for us and that whatever we do practice, we understand what we're doing. So we don't feel, uh, if anybody does say anything that says we're doing something wrong, well, if we understand what we're doing, we know whether we're doing wrong or whether what we're doing is right. And we know. And if we do something wrong, then we can make tawbah for it. And if we're doing something right, then we can feel comfortable and say, well, I know what I'm doing. You can't say that if you don't know what you're doing. So please, I do always encourage people to research these things yourselves, educate yourselves, um, and you know, don't allow yourselves to be uh, upset or manipulated by people who may have other agendas or are just, if they don't have agendas, they have a faulty understanding themselves, um, which, you know, it, it's, a, it's not so bad if it's just a person has a faulty understanding, but if, if they have that and they're preaching to other people, um, this can be a problem because they can upset the practices of other people and they're benefiting from these things. And when they stop, then they start to be impacted spiritually in a negative way and they start to feel more withdrawn demoralized maybe in coming away from the religion so it's important that we do invest at least some time in understanding our religion in actually doing some reading and research from good sources and then we can protect ourselves from these negative influences which are impacting upon us now i hope I hope everybody will benefit from what I share um, and it gives you food for thought and you can go away and do your own research uh, to build on what I, I have, have said and also to check it because I mean and if I'm if I'm wrong please inbox me and tell me I think you're wrong <laughs> I don't mind the thing is when when you've not um, When, you, when you're not got an agenda, then you're not worried about being told if you're right or wrong. You know, my relate, my deen is my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is, it is from the heart. It is not something which I'm doing because there's any worldly benefit that has come my way in the past 20 years that, since I embraced Islam. I do these these videos simply because I know what it's like when we're told information which is misleading and when people are guilt tripped about their religion and they end up feeling reluctant to take part in things which are beneficial activities 
Uh, I've been there. It's not nice. And I just do these videos because I seek to um, help uh, my brothers and sisters in Islam understand the religion better and also anybody else who's interested, whether that is purely out of curiosity or academically. Um, I think it's very important that we get the right information out there for everybody to access. Um, and also where it is available, the people know where to look. Because even on Amazon these days, you can buy a lot of good books on Islam. But you've got to know what you're looking for. Uh, just like any subject or any religion, if you buy the wrong stuff, then you can get completely, you know, the wrong information. And, and it will be misleading. Uh, but if you get, you know, books that are based on authentic sources and contain a wholesome message, then you, you will get a wholesome message and you will actually inform yourself and you, you will get the... Um, the references to the classical text. So you can actually go there yourself and further research and understand even more than whatever those books are telling you. Um, I mean, books like this one, they exist to give us pointers. It doesn't mean that we read this book and then we finish here and say, OK, I understand now. The references in this book is pointing you, look here, look there. And Moulana Sheikh Hisham has made things easy for us by doing this. But it doesn't mean that we stop there. We can actually go to those original texts and read more and develop our understanding further. But at the same time, in order to get to that point, we benefit from having a syllabus. We benefit from having a teacher which gives us pointers and shows us where to look. Not tells us what to believe, but shows us where to look. Shows us where the knowledge is and gives us an indication of what it means. So that we can then take that away and we can develop our own understanding. We can do our research ourselves and build upon that. A good student can even surpass his teacher in knowledge and understanding. But only if they're really dedicated to what they're doing. So please take that on board. And I pray uh, that uh, Allah blesses you all and whatever... Uh, you are going through in your lives that Allah makes things easier for you. I wish you all uh, a lovely evening and a nice weekend if you're in the UK. If you're elsewhere in the world, then I'm sorry it'll be a different time of the day. But whatever time of the day it is, I wish you well. And uh, may Allah bless you and your families. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa lali Sayyidina Muhammadin wa barik wa salim al-Fatiha bismillahir rahim alhamdulillah khayyar rabbil alameen ar-Rahmanir rahim maliki yawmidin إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إذن السيرات المستقيم سيرات الذين أنمت عليهم خير المكتوب عليهم والطوين آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته